Hi, I'm Randy Nessie from the Arizona State University Center for Evolution and Medicine. Today's guest is Steve Ostad, Chair of Biology from the University of Alabama in Birmingham, one of the world's experts on the evolution of aging and on aging research in general. My first question for you, Steve, is why is there aging at all? Couldn't natural selection fix it? Well, you would think it, it, it could. And, and in fact, I think people don't sufficiently, aren't sufficiently puzzled by why we age, because there's no obvious advantage to it. And this is one of the few places where natural selection really comes up against the limit. And the limit is uh, age itself. So if you think about it, even animals that were uh, theoretically immortal would gradually, would die over time due to environmental accidents. And so even in animals that never aged, there would so be- So a theoretical animal. A theoretical animal that never aged would still, there would be fewer of them that were 100 years something old. Something kills them along the way. Something kills them, a, a rock falls on their head, they eat a bad hamburger, they get run over by a bus, um, they get a really bad uh, infection. Or something, something, or that, something eats them. Or something eats them. And what that means is that the young animals are more numerous and will leave more offspring than older animals. And that sets up a dynamic by which natural selection's power to influence traits gradually wanes as things get older. And an easy way to think of this is to think about a human that had a new mutation that killed the person the day they turned 100. The day they turned 100. The day they turned 100. And so if that happened, what would be its effect on the number of offspring they left? It not would much. Be not much at all. On the other hand, if they had that same mutation that killed them the day they turned 50, then they might still be putting their kids through medical school. They might still be helping out with their grandkids. It's likely to affect their reproduction. But so, not so, so as a much. Lot of, a lot of people yeah. think that women, after they stop reproducing because of menopause, can't have any effect. Yes, well, clearly they can help their daughters take care of their children. And so there's. And their sons, too, I would wager. Uh, their, their children, yes. But, but the interesting thing so people think that uh, uh, reproduction is over the last time you. You know, you, you have a child, but in fact, reproduction lasts until your last child or your last grandchild potentially is independent. So you're doing things to help your own genes that are also in them. Right. So, but here's the problem. Because natural selection gradually fades out, if there's a gene that does kill you, it, it has no effect, but it does kill you the day you turn 100, natural selection cannot get rid of that gene. And over evolutionary time, genes of that nature that have very bad effects late in life can potentially accumulate in your genome. You basically, your genome can be a genetic garbage can of genes that only have late effects. So if mutations do bad things to you late in life, it sounds like natural selection just can't do anything about it, and it's just too bad. That's right. That's the way it is. So is that, is that the explanation for aging? Well, well, that's one, and that's probably a playing a role because we know of a handful of genes that seem to be have that effect. But there's a seemingly a more important uh, dynamic here, and that's if there are genes that we have that are beneficial for us early in life, but they're detrimental for us later in life because natural selection is so much more powerful early in life. Those can actually be advantageous and be selected for even though they may cause, let's say, cancer really? late in life. So yeah. a gene that causes cancer might be selected for because it does important, useful things earlier in life when selection is stronger. That's right. And, and in fact, we know some specific That has a cases fancy name, I think. It has a name called antagonistic pleiotropy. That sounds like big-time jargon, but useful <laughs> jargon. <laughs> useful jargon, right, because... What does antagonistic mean? Antagonistic, it's different at different times of life. Pleiotropy is a description of a single gene that has many effects. So it has a mm -hmm. beneficial effect early, detrimental effect late. And of course, I'm especially fond of this idea because my whole career in evolutionary medicine was spurred by reading a paper by George Williams in 1957 where he first suggested that. And I said, oh my God, aging has an evolutionary explanation. What about all kinds of other things that cause problems in the clinic? So this is a, a crucial moment in development of the field. And, 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 it, was, and it was a prescient idea. I mean, it, 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 it has stood the test of time. And in fact, it's one of these ideas that's gotten more and more and more important over time. So are there a couple of examples of tests of this hypothesis that have supported it? 
oh, there's a, a number of tests. One of the tests you could imagine is to partially disable one of these genes that's beneficial in life and see if it has a beneficial effect later in life. Hmm. And so you could reverse the things. And so we now have probably a hundred genes. Let me just give you an example. Hmm. There's, a, there's a gene in a, in a receptor for insulin you know, that helps us use our energy. And that increases lifespan in a lot of things. And so you would think, well, why isn't that gene there in all the wild populations? So why doesn't natural selection increase its frequency? Yes, and it turns out it's because when you partially disable that, it reduces your reproduction early in life. And Just one, because you can't have babies or because you can't run as fast and you sleep too much? Well, in, in this case, it's because you really can't reproduce. You can't have babies. So that's so longer life, but no, no babies are. That's, that's right. So that's not a good trade off from an evolutionary standpoint, which explains Might why. Might be good it's not. if people don't want to have babies, though. For humans, if we could artificially turn off that gene after people have decided they don't want to have more babies, then yes, that's a possible route to therapies for aging. Mm -hmm. So as you know, I've argued before in my work with George Williams that we shouldn't expect to be able to change lifespan dramatically in any species because natural selection should have already you know, created what it can create, but your results and those of others show that that's wrong. Yes, yes, we now have lots and lots of ways to do that. Now, all of these ways we think have some sort of effect on reproductive fitness. So trade-offs of some yes, sort. Yes, some trade-offs of some, but for humans, they may not care about that. If you reach a certain age and you're not interested in your reproduction anymore, maybe that you'd love to turn that gene off that's gonna prevent you from getting cancer or delay Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So that really is the route to what we think is a future for basically another 10 to 20 years of additional health. So we have some evidence that some genes are kind of just sitting there because they haven't been selected against, doing bad things late in life because selection's been too weak. And we have other genes, more properly alleles really, that have advantages early in life that are selected for, even though they do bad things later. Right. Are those the main two ideas? Or are those, those, we th should those really are the main two ideas, and those ideas have been incredibly explanatory because we did, when those ideas were created, we knew nothing about genetics really or the underlying molecular processes that were going on and yet everything we've learned in the last 60 years has really tended to support those ideas. So those ideas has helped to guide some of the research in gerontology. And Absolutely. Research. In fact, even though it's jargon, you now almost always hear at aging conferences the term antagonistic pliotropy. Is that right? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So your research has also led you to a large experiment that you're doing now, I'm not sure if you can talk about it, about how to slow aging in general. Right, we have some very, some very strong evidence from experimental animals, mice, that certain drugs, we now have at least a dozen drugs that seem to slow aging in our experimental animals. So we're about to start the first human trial of one of these So this drugs. is something people have sought for centuries. Um, has evolutionary thinking led to any of these or is it just empiricism or what? No, these are drugs that were actually developed to treat specific diseases for the most part. The drug that we think we're going to try first is a drug that's the most commonly prescribed anti-diabetic drug in the world. It's called metformin. Hmm. But there's a lot of evidence that it does more than prevent diabetes. So people with diabetes die young even though they're taking the drug. Well, actually, there's a big study that shows that people taking the drug because they have diabetes live longer than people that are healthy and are not Is that right? diabetes. It's one of the reasons wow. we decided to do this study. Wow. Um, the other thing is that this drug has an incredibly, uh, incredible history of safety. So we don't have to worry about a lot of side effects that catch us off guard with this drug. And the other thing that's nice is it's cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. So nobody's going to get rich on it, and it may turn out to be effective against dementia, cancer, heart disease as well. So, so one of the things we say in evolutionary medicine, kind of a mantra, is evolution never gives you guidance directly about what treatments are good. You've got to do the studies. Is this an exception to that? No, no. I mean, we've done the studies in animals, but we haven't done the studies in people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, laboratory mice and, and our fruit flies, they're not people. And so, so they live a little bit longer? Or? Uh, bit longer? Well, we think probably t 10 to 25 percent longer. That's a lot. It's a lot, and the important thing is health, not the longevity. Well, you you so talked about the health span instead of the lifespan. I yeah, like we, li we like to get away from lifespan and aging because we don't care how long people live. What we want to do is preserve health. If mm -hmm. we preserve health and a side effect of that is making people live longer, well, that's fine. But the main goal mm -hmm. is to increase health.